Welcome to today's briefing, co-hosted by the Federal Trade Commission, our longtime partner, the leading federal agency charged with protecting the public from deceptive or unfair business practices and from unfair methods of competition. It does this through law enforcement, advocacy, research, and education. Today, our topic is an alarming increase in imposter scam losses, what people are reporting, and how to fight back. Did someone tell you to move or transfer money to protect it? Did they claim it to be from a government agency like the FTC or the Social Security Administration or a well-known company like your bank, Amazon, or Microsoft? That's a scam. The FTC reports a steep rise in reported losses to scams that impersonate businesses and government agencies. Many now start with a call or message about a routine problem like suspicious activity on an account. But in a new twist, which we'll hear about, the story takes a more serious turn. FTC consumer fraud experts, and we have two of the very best, will explain the top five impersonation scams people are reporting and how to spot and report them. Our speakers are Katie Daffin, Assistant Director, Division of Marketing Practices, the FTC, Washington, and D.C., and Emma Fletcher, Senior Data Researcher with the FTC at the Washington Bureau of Washington Headquarters. We ask speakers to speak slowly for our interpreters, as I'm doing, and urge everyone, this is the great opportunity to share what's happened to you, what's happened to people you know about, what stories have you been able to report, and what questions do you have? Just signal me on the chat, and I hope I'll have a chance to call on you, or our speakers can also respond when they see your question on the chat. We'll be sending a video of today's briefing and expanded biographies for our speakers so that everyone has a copy by this afternoon. And now let's welcome our first speaker, Emma Fletcher, Senior Data Researcher, who will share the information the FTC has compiled on impersonator scams. Emma, welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thanks to the audience uh, today. We know that uh, your work plays an absolutely critical role in getting the word out to the public about scams. So we're really uh, grateful for your participation today. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my slides. Uh, let's see. Just a moment. Okay. Here we go. Did that work? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so as Sandy explained, we're going to be talking about impersonation scams today. Um, and I'm going to start uh, uh, kind of at a high level with the big picture numbers. Uh, as she said, I am a data researcher, so there will be some numbers today. Um, <clears throat> and then we'll take a deeper dive into some of the uh, more specific scams that we're seeing in this uh, category. Um, sorry, the Zoom is covering my, 
my slide progression button. Okay, there we go. Um, <clears throat> so the FTC takes in millions of reports from the public about scams each year. Last year, we took in 2.6 million. Uh, and every year, these impersonation scams stand out as by far the most frequently reported type. Uh, so they're clearly a very big problem. Uh, and impersonation scams are really a broad category. This includes scams that impersonate well-known businesses, uh, government agencies, including the FTC, unfortunately, uh, and scams that pretend to be someone you know, like a family member or a friend. Uh, it also includes romance scams. So in just the first half of the year, we received 360,000 reports about impersonation scams with 1.3 billion in reported losses. Uh, and this is really just the tip of the iceberg. The research tells us that less than 5% of people who experience a scam report it. So when you think about it that way, this is really an enormous problem. Uh, the median loss to these scams in the first half of the year was $800. But I can tell you that behind that number are people who've lost tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of dollars. We're really concerned about uh, the volume of reports we're getting on scams that are, are really taking it all. Um, people have emptied their bank accounts, even emptied their retirement accounts. So today I wanna to focus on scams that impersonate uh, well-known businesses and government agencies. And this is because that's where we're seeing the tremendous increase in reported losses. Uh, you can see that compared to 2020, reported losses to these two types of scams have increased almost fourfold uh, and they've continued to climb in 2024. Uh, and this trend is driven, again, by an increase in reports from people who've lost enormous sums of money. Uh, and it's tied to some really concerning changes in the tactics that these scammers are using. So I'm going to drill down a little bit on what those tactics are, and then I'm going to give you an example uh, from our Sentinel database of an actual report. So first, uh, the <clears throat> number of scams or number of reports about scams that start with a phone call is actually down. Uh, texts and emails are increasingly important. But the end goal is typically still to get the person on the phone. So the text or the email will generally include a number to call. So that's important. Second, we're seeing uh, what I like to call tag team scams. So it used to be more that we had business impersonation scams and separately we had scams that impersonate the government. That's all changed. Uh, the scammers today are blurring the line. Uh, so, so these are scams that uh, typically will start out uh, impersonating uh, a business, let's say your bank, it might be about suspicious charges on an account. But when you respond, the situation escalates very rapidly. Uh, it becomes much more serious. Uh, you know, your accounts are at risk. Uh, of course, it's still entirely fake. Uh, and part of that escalation is uh, that they will connect you with a government agency. Uh, this is what we typically see. And the idea is to heighten your emotions, create a sense of urgency, alarm, uh, all of the things that would make it difficult for any of us to be able to think clearly, uh, to be able to summon what we know about scams, uh, and to be able to um, recognize and uh, you know hang up the phone. The third thing is that we're seeing that with many of these scams, people actually are convinced uh, that they are protecting their money. Um, and this is a key driver of these really huge losses we're seeing. So people who believe they're protecting their money from bad actors uh, will, as we've seen, empty their bank accounts, even empty their retirement savings, believing that they are protecting the money. Uh, if you believe you're paying someone, you might be a little bit cautious about giving them everything you have, right? But if you believe you're protecting your money, you're protecting yourself, um, you're going to potentially empty all of your accounts. 
Uh, and with these scams, this, the scammer will uh, position themselves as someone who is helping you to get this situation sorted out. Uh, so that's very different. They're not necessarily the aggressor that we've seen in the past. Uh, they're, they're someone who's informing of you, uh, informing you of this terrible problem, but they're on your side and they're going to help you resolve it is, is what they lead people to believe. Uh, and then finally, we're seeing a huge losses uh, by bank transfer and by cryptocurrency. These two payment methods have just skyrocketed in terms of the uh, reported losses. Um, and many of the cryptocurrency losses, particularly when we're talking impersonation scams, uh, involve the use of Bitcoin ATM machines. So people are being told to go to uh, Bitcoin ATM machines and load cash into those machines. Uh, the scammers are even calling these machines federal safety lockers, which goes hand in hand with the story that they are directing you to the machine to protect your money. Uh, so clearly this is very concerning, especially when you consider how uh, common these machines have become uh, in many different communities. Um, so, of course, there are countless businesses and agencies being impersonated at any given time, and those details are easily switched up. But we're also seeing a sort of characteristic set of tactics underlying many of the most alarming and costly of these scams. Uh, so this is the new twist, I guess you could say, that, that Sandy mentioned. Uh, it's, it's really got our attention. Uh, so this is a paraphrased actual example from Sentinel that I hope will illustrate what I mean. Uh, I think examples go a long way in doing that. But again, it's also really important to emphasize that it's just an example and there are a lot of variations in these details. Um, but these tactical elements that I'll describe are kind of the common thread um, that we want you all to be aware of. Um, First of all, this, the types of scams I'm referring to typically start with a routine, but really hard to ignore message about a problem. So often it'll be a text. Uh, it might be, in, as in this example, it's Amazon. Uh, she's told, uh, the, the text indicates there's been a purchase made on her Amazon account that she didn't make. Um, but it, it could just as easily be a message from your bank uh, it could also be a security alert on your computer, a pop-up alert that's fake, um, that looks to be from, say, Microsoft or Apple. Uh, there will be a number to call, uh, and people who call the number believe they're calling their bank, they believe they're calling Amazon, Microsoft, and so forth, uh, and they think they're calling to resolve this fake problem. Um, step two is escalation. Uh, once they call in, they're told the situation is actually very serious. Uh, and the, again, the stories vary here a lot. Um, in this example, she's told people are opening bank accounts in her name for drug smuggling and money laundering. Uh, I've seen this one many times. Uh, and you can see that she's passed to the Social Security Administration and then the US Marshals. So this is the tag teaming I spoke about earlier. Uh, and notice all the details. Uh, they give her a badge number. Uh, all of these details make it seem, you know, very realistic. Um, and once people are sufficiently alarmed and their doubts, if they have doubts, have been put to rest, and you can see in this example, they actually tell her to Google the name of the supposed uh, U.S. Marshals officer, which she does. And, you know, apparently they're impersonating a real U.S. Marshals officer who's information is on the internet. So they've thought of everything. Um, but once the doubts have been put to rest, um, they direct the person on how to move the money to protect it uh, or to fix the problem. Uh, in this example, a Bitcoin ATM was used. As I mentioned, we also see bank transfers. Uh, we've also had reports of people handing cash or even gold bars to couriers who come to their homes. Uh, and throughout this process, people are coached to stay on the phone and to lie to anyone who tries to intervene. 
So this is this is the one, as I said, that we're, we really wanted to to uh, describe today. Very, very concerning, huge losses, and and it's something that um, we're hoping uh, that we can get the word out about. But there are also many other types of impersonation scams. Uh, in May, we published a data spotlight that identified the top five business and government impersonation scams of 2023. Uh, the example I just gave really fits with the number one most frequently reported type, um, but we're also seeing uh, many others, uh, including uh, fake subscription renewals, uh, often that's Geek Squad, uh, people who, who are told they've won the publisher's clearinghouse sweepstakes, but first they have to pay to get their money. Um, we've seen texts about fake package delivery problems. Uh, bogus problems with the law, which, uh, as in the example we just gave, can kind of go hand in hand with the, the copycat account security alerts. Uh, so many different flavors of impersonation scams are circulating. Uh, and if you check out that spotlight at uh, fdc.gov slash spotlight, you can uh, learn more about how each of these work. Because I know on their face, it might be hard to imagine how a message about a package delivery could lead to you uh, losing money, but indeed, um, the the tactics that they've worked out uh, are incredibly effective at doing that. So I'll pause here and uh, see if we have questions. Well, yes, um, that was a wonderful overview. One of the questions was, is there an actual report from the FTC? And Jennifer Leach, who's on the call, has posted it on the chat and will send the latest report on this uh, from the FTC in the collateral. A question that Henrietta Burroughs has and which I share. Henrietta, can you ask your question? Thanks so much, Sandy. Uh, sorry for the delay unmuting. Um, you mentioned people transferring money to cryptocurrency machines. Are there any protections whatsoever uh, in regards to these machines and who oversees them and how legitimate are they? And is there a picture we could send of what a cryptocurrency ATM machine looks like. I don't think I've ever seen one. <laughs> Neither <Sure>. have I. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, I can answer that. Hi, everyone. This is Katie Daffin. I'm in our division of marketing practices. And I think it's a great idea to share some photos and images of crypto ATM machines. But um, what they look like is similar to an ATM machine that you would see standing in your neighborhood bodega. Um, and the difference is that the use is not to take out cash, but to buy and transfer cryptocurrency. And there are many different brands and appearances. Um, and your question is a great one, Henrietta. Is there a single government agency that oversees these cryptocurrency ATMs? The answer is no. Um, they are subject to uh, overlapping you know, legal considerations from various different agencies, but there's no single regulator for these. Um, but it's a great question and maybe worthy of a longer article <laughs> if someone would like to write it. Yeah, I the latest. The, the latest facilitator or the latest window into stealing your money are these crypto machines and here's what they look like and be on your guard. Um, I have a question, which is you mentioned, I think 5% as being the kind of, if, if this many calls have been received about losses to impersonation scams. It really is the tip of the iceberg, you said, an estimated 5%. Did I hear that correctly? And how do you calculate that number? So uh, 
We have um, a, a, well, it's a former economist at the FTC published a report uh, a couple of years ago where he uh, used FTC surveys to estimate underreporting. So that's that's where I'm getting the less than 5%. Less than 5% report to the Better Business Bureau or a government agency. And since Sentinel includes reports from uh, the Better Business Bureau, that's that's where why we use that figure. But we've also done um, analysis. One of our economists, Davis uh, Raval, uh, has done an analysis where he actually compared uh, data from actual FTC cases where we have, you know, a complete inventory of all the consumers who were affected and comparing that to Sentinel reports to see, well, you know, all of these people were impacted by this scam. How many of them actually reported? And he found similarly very, very low reporting rates. So <clears throat> it's tip of the iceberg for sure. This is fascinating. And I have a number of other questions, and there are some questions in the chat, but I think we'll go to our second speaker who may actually have the answers to some of my questions. And so now we welcome Katie Daffin, who's been a frequent uh, presenter on our FTC calls uh, and, in fact, in person. Uh, at our conferences. Katie, welcome. And Katie is the Assistant Director of the Division of Marketing Practices for the FTC. Hello, everyone. I feel very lucky and proud to be a frequent collaborator at these events. And I'm going to talk a little bit today about what the FTC is doing about impersonation scams. Emma, are you going to continue sharing the slides? Yes, I can do that. Okay, great. Um, so, but I will jump right in because we are doing a lot when it comes to impersonation scams, when it comes to law enforcement, policy, and consumer outreach and education. And so I'll start by talking about an important policy development from earlier this year, which is a brand new rule called the FTC impersonator rule. And under this rule, it is now a violation explicitly to pretend to be the government or an officer of the government or to pretend to be a business or an officer of the business. It's also a violation of the rule to claim some kind of affiliation or that you were endorsed by or sponsored by the government or a particular business. So this rule is going to give us much stronger tools to combat scammers who impersonate government agencies and businesses. Most importantly, it will allow us to file cases seeking to get money back to people who lost their money to these scammers. Emma, are you able to share the slides or do you want me to do are, it online? Are you not, you're not seeing the slides? No. Oh goodness, okay, I don't know when that started. Okay, let me. But you're so clear, it's almost as if we don't need it. I hope they were shared when I was presenting. I Yes, they were great. Uh, but oh, okay, but then, then somehow they stopped. Uh -huh. Okay, you see them now? Yes. yes. Okay, Perfect. sorry about Thank that. You. No problem, no problem. Um, so, and, and moving on from this slide, uh, we have started to use this rule in our law enforcement. But to answer Henrietta's question, even before we had the FTC impersonator rule, we were seeking to hold impersonator scammers liable for their scams. And uh, I've worked on some examples of these. One case called American Immigration Center, where we accuse the defendants of pretending to be affiliated with US immigration authorities. Um, and we've had many others over the years. But now that we have this new tool, I wanted to tell you about our very first case using the tool, which was a case um, that we probably all can relate to if we know anyone who suffers from having a lot of student loans. And so the story behind this case is that people would get communications 
from somebody pretending to be affiliated with the US Department of Education. And they would be told, this is your final notice. This is a time sensitive notice and you can get complete loan forgiveness or you can get tax free loan forgiveness to entice consumers to call them and speak to a telemarketer. Then the telemarketers claiming to be affiliated with the US government would convince people to sign up for their debt relief program. And instead of helping them with the burden of their student loans, they would collect hundreds of dollars in illegal upfront fees from consumers. And of course, they were not affiliated with the US Department of Education at all. So our litigation against this operation is ongoing right now. And you can expect to see more work along these lines using our new tool of the impersonator rule. Um, but from there, as you all know, another thing that the FTC is doing is always consumer outreach and education. So we can go to the next slide because we all know that if we can prevent someone from being scammed in the first place, that is the best way for us to serve our communities. And so we have had a huge push to educate and inform consumers from every community about the dangers of imposter scams. And a great place to start to see what we're doing on this front is to go to ftc.gov slash imposters, or you can visit in Spanish, ftc.gov slash impostores. And there you can find a lot of great materials that we've pulled together. And we'll go to the next slide to show you an example. We have many shareable messages that are clear and actionable. And all of our messages drive people to file reports with the FTC at reportfraud.ftc.gov, that very important <laughs> URL at the bottom of the slide. This is so important for us because when we hear about the details as scammers continue to change their tactics over time, we can then inform the public about those trends and bring law enforcement actions that are responsive to stop the fraud that's happening in the marketplace. So what are the main consumer messages that we want to share right now, given what scammers tactics are right now? That's what I'm going to cover briefly next. Um, first, uh, if you go to the next slide, we have a list of things that only scammers will say. And um, first of those things is act now. We would love for you to tell your readers that if they hear this, it's a sign of a scam because scammers use pressure, um, time pressure, so that people can't think about what they're being asked to do. And when anyone hears act now, that's always the sign of a scam. A second thing is, only say what I tell you to say. The minute someone says to lie to anyone, including lying to a bank teller, for example, or an investment broker, we know that is a scam. And it's something we hear very often. Another thing only scammers will say is, do what I tell you or you'll be arrested. Okay, any threat like that is a lie because nobody needs money or information to keep people out of jail, keep people from being deported, or avoid bigger fines. Those are all scams that we see very often though. And then finally, scammers will say, don't hang up. If someone wants to keep a person on the phone while they go and withdraw money or transfer money or buy gift cards, that's a scammer. And we often do hear that scammers say, don't hang up because they don't want someone to have an opportunity to think for a moment, to talk to someone they know and trust, or even to talk to the person who's selling them gift cards. So onto the next slide, one more thing that we have pulled together to help uh, inform consumers 
is a list of things that only scammers will tell you to do. And so any of these is also a sure sign of a scam. Anyone who says, move your money to protect it is a scammer. Nobody legitimate will tell you to transfer or withdraw money from a bank or investment account. Anyone who says, withdraw cash and give it to anyone, that's a scam. And people shouldn't give cash to a courier. They shouldn't deliver it. They shouldn't send it anywhere because all of those are very popular scams. As Emma mentioned, anyone who says go to a Bitcoin ATM or a crypto ATM, that's a scam and nobody legitimate will ever insist that people do that. And, and there's no legitimate reason for someone to send a person to a Bitcoin ATM. And then finally, buy gift cards is a scam. There's never a reason to pay for anything with a gift card. They're for gifts, not payments. And once someone shares the PIN numbers on the back of a gift card, the money is as good as gone. So this is another absolute sign of a scam. And with that, I did want to mention one other thing on the next slide, which is that among our consumer education materials, you can find a great blog series called Anatomy of an Imposter Scam. If you want to write something that dives a little bit deeper into these topics, we have all of these great blog posts that dive into different angles of imposter scams. And you can find them all at ftc.gov slash imposter. And um, just a reminder, none of our material is copyrighted. We would absolutely love for you to help us spread the word about all these different uh, ways that people are imposing, in pretending to be other people in order to scam our communities. And with that, I think Emma and I are ready to take your questions. And I'm going to first start by looking at the chat, which I haven't been able to follow very well to see if there are some there that we can answer. I can um, start by one of Henrietta Burroughs' great questions, which is who teaches these scammers about tactics? Are there training schools and trainers that we can locate and prosecute? These are very sophisticated methods to use on people. And I will say, I completely agree. Scammers are incredibly sophisticated in what they do. And it's important for all of us to tell people about that because People used to say, look for typos. It's obvious that it's a scammer. None of that is true anymore. These people are extremely sophisticated and we all have to be on the lookout for it. In terms of training schools and trainers, I uh, have not heard of anything organized in that way. But what I will say from my law enforcement experience is that scammers constantly scam each other and steal from each other. <laughs> and so you do see their tactics spreading like wildfire. And as soon as one tactic starts to work well, then you will see other people start to use it in different communities and in different settings um, because there is a, a, uh, a way that they know about what they're doing and what's successful and you can see it spread very organically. Let me follow up that question with the observation that I think one of the reasons that there isn't more attention paid to these scams is that scammers are faceless. You think about the swarm of, of, of kind of robberies that happened <clears throat> when people smash and grab, went into storefronts and stole goods. And it was like everybody saw it and thought, oh, I, those, are, those are robbers, those are 
thugs and it was very visual, but we never get a sense of who these scammers are because uh, they're, they're faceless, they're invisible. So how, if we were to do a story on who, who's your typical scammer, who are the scammers that are behind this rise in impersonation scams, how would you answer that question and how could we how could we report who the scammers are pulling the mask off this faceless crime? I can take a first stab at that. It's a very good question, Sandy, and it relates to a question in the chat about whether the scammers are in the United States or overseas. And we have seen so many variations on who are the scammers over the years when we bring these cases. Uh, some of our cases, once we dig into who is behind these phone calls, who is behind these internet ads, we find that it's a very sophisticated international ring. <laughs> and um, sometimes we're able to find some portion of that within the United States, which makes it easier for us to bring a law enforcement action and address that conduct. Other times we find that there are people, companies here in the United States that are conducting these scams. And of course that makes it much easier for us to bring a lawsuit and stop the scam. Um, but it's amazing the variation of, you know, the size of the operation, the location, the sophistication and resources. It's everything across across the board. Um, we've seen it all. So in the case that you're now applying this new tool to pursue, who do you imagine the perpetrators are in the student loan scam? that you mentioned? Yes, so in that particular case, it was um, a range of companies that they were using to perpetrate that particular fraud, which is often what we see. You know, there will be a, an individual or a small group of individuals behind it, but they will use a lot of different corporations to execute the scam to make it harder to trace what they're doing and make it harder for us to investigate. That's what we saw in that case and um, and what we've seen in many other cases in the past. Right. And a, a second question. The FTC has some wonderful news you can use kind of columns. And one of them that I now can't find is here are the steps to take when you suspect you've been scammed. This was the very simple outline of what do I do when I realize I've been scammed? And I should have been able to answer my office mate's friend's concern, which is how I found myself in possession of this FTC guide. I wonder if you could share something that outlines here are five steps to take when you think you've been scammed. Yes, Jennifer just posted um, in the chat ftc.gov slash scams. And then Rosario posted what to do if you were scammed, which is a, a PDF um, page that you can uh, use and share in your networks. That's Both great. of these give steps and it depends on the payment method that you used when you were scammed. Yeah, and I'll just add that on reportfraud.ftc.gov, where people are going to report these scams to the FTC, uh, consumers get uh, customized next steps uh, based on what the scam was, how they paid, how, even how they were contacted in some cases. So we are trying to give um, people um, some action steps they can take once they report. Okay, I think there's a lot of interest looking at the chat in trying to put a description of who we're talking about when we 
use the word scammers, questions like, is one country the sort of hotbed for this kind of activity? And of course, we've seen stories about human traffickers essentially luring people uh, to, in this case, Northeast Thailand, where the, they wind up being sort of uh, captives and having to perform the phone calls and and online scamming information. So are we seeing this as part of uh, the kind of cartel, what we used to call mafia, now they're cartels? Are, are you researching this field. I think all of us are interested because some of us may come from countries where they're now becoming sort of centers for scam activity. So yes, we do research um, what are the transnational uh, issues that come with fraud, including what you mentioned, Sandy, the horrific examples of you know, forced slavery working on scams that we've seen around the world. Um, we have an Office of International Affairs that um, works regularly with people around the world on all kinds of consumer protection issues. And we're also part of um, various organizations like the Global Anti-Fraud Enforcement Network, um, where we are constantly coordinating on these types of efforts. So let's go back to the chat. Um, uh, Renee, Barbie, do you want to uh, kind of share your experience or your observation? Sure. Um, I get, uh, I've been hacked quite often this year alone. And because of the, because of, of, my, of, of my personal information being out there, they have my email, they have my cell phone number, they have everything on me. They continuously send, send emails and I can easily spot the scam by the email address, the wording, the grammar, the spelling, it's all really bad. They ask for gift cards. They, they, they Sometimes they're threatening, like Jeff got a threatening uh, um, a scam email in his, uh, in, his, in his spam and he reported it to the FBI. I told him to report it to the FBI. We haven't heard back, but it's happening every single week. And there's nothing I can do but block them and report them. Thank you for reporting that to the authorities. Um, that's very helpful. And I'm sorry that that's happening to you. We do see that sometimes if your phone number or your email address gets on a particular list, then you can have a real uptick in activity from scammers. And so I'm glad you're so aware and um, and so careful now that that's happening to you. Oh I'm yeah, def definitely. I mean, I, 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 every time I see one, I have to block them because it's they, it's every day. It's I mean, they come in at two, three, four o'clock in the morning, and nobody sends me emails that early in the morning if they're legit. I would just also comment on you know, there's a lot of interest in who are the scammers, but it's also important to um, talk about you know who. Are, is being impacted by scams. And from what we see, despite a lot of sort of stereotypes and misconceptions about who's impacted by scams, really it is everyone, um, you know, people of all ages, every community. And, um, you know, these, these are people that are just like those in your family or people you know in your community. They're not, you know, less intelligent, greedy, any of those things that um, you hear out there, I think it's really important to put those ideas to rest because they are barriers to, um, you know, people being receptive to messages about how to avoid scams. You know, many young people, for example, don't think it can happen to them. And that's not what we're seeing. We're seeing a lot of scams affecting young people as well as older adults and everything in between. And um, the thing is, as we discussed with many of these scams, they are able to create such a sense of panic and urgency in people um, that 
really what you know about scams, what you, um, you know, what, what you will later look back on and say, how in the world could that have happened to me? In that moment, it can be very, very difficult to recognize that it's a scam. And unfortunately, scammers have, I, I believe, become increasingly sophisticated yeah. in, in their approaches and have really perfected it. Um, so I think it's really important for all of us just to, to keep that in mind, how we talk about it is so important right. so, uh, it happen to anyone. Um, my colleague, uh, Sunita Saravji has a personal stake in all this from having had her daughter recently scammed. And she has a question growing out of that. Sunita, could you share the story of what happened to your daughter and the question you have about banks' responsibilities. Thank you, Sandy. Um, yeah, so as I mentioned at the uh, start of this briefing, um, my daughter, Yvonne, tried to sell her um, bike via Facebook Marketplace. This is the first time that she tried to sell anything. And um, a potential buyer came back to her saying that they wanted to buy the bike uh, but um, and that they would pay through Zelle, but that she first had to establish a Zelle business account and to put 500 or $400 rather to the uh, uh, account that they had uh, sent her. So she did that. Uh, they told her the money would be refunded once the transaction was made. Of course, that never happened. So what was her, her bank is Chase Bank. What was Chase Bank's responsibility in that transaction? And can she at any point get some of her money back or is that lost? This is another good topic for a longer article, <laughs> if you'd like to look into it. It's very interesting. Um, it, the bank's responsibilities in these types of situations depend on a lot of things, including exactly how a payment was made and um, exactly what type of payment and um, and how the transfer occurred. And so- um, In, in other words, do... could, could I just interrupt you? Sure. Because how did she make her payment, Sunita, to the Via bank? Zell. 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 Yeah. yeah. Right. Okay. Sorry. I. Great. Sorry, yeah. uh, Katie. No problem, Sandy. It's a good thing to clarify um, because there were actually congressional hearings about Zelle and what should be the role of financial institutions when fraud occurs on Zelle. Um, so it's an open question um, what it should be. And um, right now we do always encourage people to go and report to their bank when something like this happens. And if they are unhappy with how their bank handles it, you can also file a report with the CFPB about how your bank handled it and try to explore in that way. Thank you so much. Um, we have an important question from Orhan. Uh, Orhan, I, I'll, do you wanna ask your question? or maybe we're having a hard time unmuting you, but it's a question I had as well. How are the scammers getting our phone numbers? What are typical ways that even before we're being scammed, somehow they have our phone numbers? So, we have seen a variety of different tactics by scammers. One thing that happens is scammers sell lists of people and contact information, which can contain a lot of data about people or sometimes doesn't. Sometimes it's just a list of phone numbers. Other tactics we've seen include just literally blasting out calls to a series of numbers, you know, from one to a thousand, marching through all the numbers. It has become that cheap to place phone calls. And so unfortunately, um, sometimes we're not even being targeted directly. We're just getting hit 
with a spray of phone calls that's going out to the entire population. I'm just making sure I'm not missing anybody um, on the call and uh, any question in the chat. Um, I see a question from, yeah. oh, sorry, Sandy, go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead. Um, I saw Henrietta Burroughs' question, why can't money that is transferred from an account be traced as to where it went? So why can't scammers be traced as the recipients of a transaction? Which is a great question, because of course, everyone would imagine that when we investigate, we follow the money. That's the most obvious thing that we do. But um, scammers are very good at hiding their tracks. So once money is transferred, it will often leave that receiving account immediately and go somewhere else. It can go overseas. It can be transferred in some other way that's impossible to trace. And so um, while following the money does help us find scammers quite often, they certainly have many ways to hide their tracks through additional transfers. I would like to ask all our media on the call, if there is a glaring example of one of these scams that you've reported on or want to report on, do you want to share it with us now so that so much of this is capturing our audience's attention with stories in real time that have happened to our community members. But very rarely are people willing to share those stories. There is so much embarrassment. Um, so just in our last remaining uh, eight to 10 minutes, if anyone has a story to share, please use the yellow hand icon and I'll call on you. So Henrietta, you you have uh, obviously a key eye for this and you have a personal story to share. We'd love to hear it. Yes, mine isn't a long story. Uh, I wasn't scammed, but I recently got an email telling me that I had a package from FedEx that couldn't be delivered to me until I gave additional information. And I checked into my Amazon account where I usually order things and I hadn't ordered anything that was coming from FedEx. So I immediately um, marked the email as a scam with a big red flag and deleted it. I mean, I hadn't ordered anything, so why should I give information about a package that uh, was obviously a fake? Right. I. That's a very good warning because I get a lot of emails and think, oh, I have a package waiting for me. I wonder what that is. And it never occurs to me that they're fishing for information. So that that's very good. I have this real sense that if we could just put out a description of a scam a week, we'd get a very popular response from our community audiences because people, people really love to kind of learn through reading about these actual stories. Um, let's see who else has a story to share. And I, I would say, um, Elena, you've, from Slavic Sec, you've had a couple of comments on the chat. Do you have a personal story or a story involving the uh, Slavic community, Ukrainian, Russian, Slavic. Uh, I'm 
putting you on the spot. Yeah, thank you, Sandy. Uh, actually, we have um, had several cases. Uh, fortunately, they didn't develop well, uh, bad for us. But uh, first of all, those unlimited number of uh, messages or emails that we allegedly have like FedEx or something delivered, like you already mentioned, it's first thing. Another thing, I believe our colleagues in other in other media also face this kind of scam. When we receive uh, emails almost daily, like we have a problem with the server or with the server provider, we have to extend it or something. And they, of course, suggest a link to click on and to fix the problem. And of course, if you yes. click, it's it's a scamming link. And we never do this, but we receive so many emails like that. And another type of email, it's like uh, from former former users of countries, which uh, like some businesses uh, email to us saying oh, uh, we provided service for, to you and you have to pay for that. So here is the uh, the bill uh, with the due date, blah, blah, blah. So you have to click again and to pay us, something like that. We also received lots of emails like that. But since we know that, for example, we didn't deal with our um, providers from this or that country, of course, we never follow those links. But, you know, it's so tempting. You like, you, you think, oh, probably have to follow something, I need to check something, but you have to stay away from all those links, you know? Yeah, so that's, that's our experience. So, uh, thank you. And we have time for one more. Selena Rodriguez, there is always time for your comment of what happened to you, Selena Rodriguez. Unmute. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I, I'm always telling my audience, please be aware. Don't do this. Don't do that. 43 years uh, in experience in journalism, and I just fell in their hands completely. I felt so damn. It was so embarrassing having to go to Bank of America and explain. They called me, you you bought a phone, an iPhone, and uh, did you do that? And I said, no, of course. Of course, I was in a rush running from one place to another. I had to do uh, a radio program. And I just felt the way how they talked to me. They got me involved. I was panicking and making the story short. I got them into my computer. I let them into my computer to that point. So I feel so stupid. I feel damn. And when Bank of America called me, what's going on? Because I even sell money to them. The way how they get you involved is amazing. That's all I can say. We are so vulnerable now. And as we age, we become easy targets of that. So I don't know. I mean, it's I feel really bad, embarrassed, and I share that with my community, you know? Did so you, this is a, excellent. Thank you so much. Did you, uh, I'm just curious, it's not too late to report what happened to you to the FTC. Oh, and, yeah. Uh -huh. uh, I, would, I would do that. I mean, this happened two years ago. Uh, fortunately, uh, Bank of America supported me. We stopped that. and uh, They told me, shut your computer down. First step, shut it down. And then my IT support has to had to come here and 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 turn it on in a safe way. We have to change passwords. But I mean, I just, I'm sharing this. I'm 69, and it becomes we become so vulnerable. Even though we are on top of things every day, we are human beings. We are vulnerable. We fall into their. They are very well trained. They know psychological tools. So it just I just wanted to say. I felt so bad, so embarrassed, and I'm sharing this in a very sincere way. Thank you. This is excellent, excellent information. Thank you so much to each Terrific. one of you. Thank you. Terrific. I would finally add to Selena's uh, comment. I've already had two requests for on-the-air interviews with our guests. Yes. One, so I'm unfortunately after the call going to be getting in touch mm -hmm. with uh our speakers to see if it's possible to do follow up in thank a... you okay thank well, you so much thank you selena so 
that is the last word from our media. Let me ask uh, both Emma and Katie for your final headline for this wonderful Zoom exchange. What would you recommend be the very short headline that you think summarizes the information you've shared with us today? I'll start with Emma. Oh boy, oh, <laughs> put me on the spot. Okay, um, I, a, a headline, if I were a reporter, um, scammers are increasingly sophisticated at impersonating businesses and government agencies. Here's what you look for. Uh, my point, uh, this is probably not a very good headline, but my point is, I hope that when you uh, write about what we've spoken about today, that um, a, you know that, that it will be a focus on on how these scams work and how to avoid them. And and thanks so much, all of you who shared your own experiences. That was really uh, really helpful. Thank you, and Katie. Uh, can you give us a knockout headline too? <laughs> I'm afraid not like your other guests here, but I would just say scams happen to everyone. Help protect your community. Great. And then I would give all the great information Emma mentioned. Terrific. Thank you very much uh, to the FTC and uh, be ready to get a phone call for me because I have three media that texted me that they would like to do interviews one-on-one. -on -one. And why not? Because as we said at the beginning, this is happening to all of us. And it's like when the earthquake shifts and I think, what do I do? How many briefings have I done on earthquake preparedness? But when it happens to you, your mind freezes and it would be great to send the news you can use here are several easy steps to take if you've gotten scammed. Okay, blessings to everyone. Thank you for joining today's call and see you next week.